Hello. I'm joined this morning by Shakantali Banerjee. She works here at LSE in the Department of Media. But before that, she was for some years a teacher in London schools, secondary schools, and is, I think, well qualified to be able to talk about the challenge that preoccupies her now here at LSE, engaging young people as citizens in our society. Uh, Shakantala, what does it mean to be a citizen these days? Well, I think there are a whole number of different definitions of citizen, but I'll take my cue from the notion of active citizenship, which I work on a lot. And I think nowadays, um, people who perceive themselves as citizens and take part in protests and take part in voting and take part in things belonging to the nation um, are one of the groups that are openly considered to be citizens. There's a whole other group of people who do all kinds of creative, perhaps artistic, perhaps resistant acts, but don't consider themselves to be citizens because no one tells them that they're citizens. In fact, they're seen as almost anti-political or anti-citizen. So you've got quite a wide definition of what it is. It's kind of participatory in the culture outside yourself. Is that what you think of citizenship as? I think it's certainly participating in culture outside yourself. It's something that's not individualistic. It's aimed at communities. But this doesn't necessarily mean that I feel there should be a normative limit on the kinds of actions placed within that notion. Mm -hmm. In mm -hmm. fact, problematically, if we define it in a normative way as only in relation to, for instance, government and voting, yeah. we exclude a whole range of people who, yeah. think, who think or don't think of themselves as yeah. citizens. So your test isn't whether that young person or anybody goes in and votes. And indeed, many of the younger people wouldn't have a vote anyway. But on your analysis, they are engaging in disruptive activity, trying to resist the extension of cuts in their areas. That kind of thing is all citizenship for you, is it? I think it absolutely is. Mm. I would widen it even further to say that young people who are simply helping to maintain their communities by doing things like supporting older people in their families or supporting younger people in their families by looking after children, by getting jobs at 16, are also citizens. They are engaging in civic behaviour. They're a different type of citizen, but the normative link to some kind of overtly political action, I think, is something that I want to question. But it's not even, listening to you, important to vote. I mean, half the youngsters, I'm told, between the ages of 18 and 24, don't vote. And in some ways, so what? Because they could be active in ways that you describe. Does the vote actually matter, do you think? I think the vote matters hugely. Mm. I, think it, I think it is important to vote, but that's just me. And I think it's important to listen to young people who think it's not important to vote, because I don't think that what they're saying is that the vote is unimportant. They're saying that the vote is so important that we will not vote if there is no one worthy of our vote. And that's actually a valuation rather than a devaluing of that form of citizenship. And if we don't enter into a conversation with those people around the issues which stop them from voting or which make them feel apathetic about the range of possibilities following a vote, then I think we're actually yeah. losing out on our citizens. Yeah, but what you're kind of saying is let's have a conversation about how you can engage. Absolutely. And we hear what you're saying about not voting and we're not just condemning you we're going to ask you how to do stuff. Is social media an obvious one here? Everybody talks about tweeting and so on. Is that an obvious way of expressing yourself politically these days? I certainly think that in Britain and Europe as a whole, social media is becoming increasingly important as an avenue where even, where certainly educated and middle class, but even mm. lower middle class and many working class young people are engaging. But they're engaging in different aspects of social media. So when you think of social media and politics, you may well think Twitter and the BBC website. When other people think of social media, they're thinking of Instagram. So you have to start thinking about what kind of politics is possible, what kind of citizenship is possible on places like Instagram and WhatsApp and on the very, very quick vines that come out. And what tends to happen is that arguments get simplified and condensed in these fora. So a very different form of politics emerges mm. on there. So I'm mm. cautious about saying this is where it's at rather mm. than on the streets and face to face. Mm. It's maybe condensed, but it's also kind of ephemeral, is it? Just to put the case against. There's great energy invested, intense energy in a particular thing. And then in an hour, two hours, a day, two days, a week, people say, oh, what was that? So is there a sort of easy come, easy go aspect to tweeting that doesn't make it very, and other social media, the sort you've mentioned, that doesn't make it really susceptible of campaigns and slow political build, which up to now is what we've needed for change? 
I'm actually ambivalent about saying it's simply ephemeral because in some ways there's something very lasting about something which goes up on the internet is not a newspaper headline which has disappeared by tomorrow but which is there perhaps 20 years later when you're an older person. Mm. So there's something about the tension between ephemerality and resilience and something that remains there leaving traces in your life which is also off-putting for some young people who are interested in politics and want to put up perhaps a Facebook profile, perhaps a headline on Twitter which says something quite political, but, but who are cautious because they've been told quite rightly in media literacy lesson, lessons or in, in other fora that it's dangerous your, your employer in the future may see mm -hmm. how you're thinking. So there is an aspect of it which is about surveillance and not just about ephemerality. And also you attract a deeper, darker kind of negativity. Supposing you put your head above the parapet to argue for, oh take a recent one, uh, more women on the yes. currency. Yes. And the world, a male angry world, anonymous male angry world, descends on you. That's the opposite of politics, isn't it? That's a kind of mob punishment for asserting yourself. I consider all of that to be politics. Mm. I think putting your head mm. above the parapet. Let's let's go back to the early struggles of miners trying to unionize in the in the United States, for instance. Putting your head above the parapet simply by saying, I don't like how much I'm being paid was enough to possibly get your family evicted from their mining cottage, mm. was possibly enough to get you shot at or killed by a group of policemen on a protest. So I think, I think we have to be very careful about assuming that everything that's happening now is new, didn't happen mm -hmm. before, and that there isn't some kind of continuity between people who were interested in and took, a, took an active role in the civic life of their countries um, from the past and yeah. the present. But just to push you a bit on it, Civic behaviour isn't just good because it happens. I mean, say, engagement in a reactionary way yeah. to fight progressive change yes. is not necessarily being a good citizen, is it? Or do you think, bring it on, anything which is about more than yourself is good citizenship? Do you have a kind of normative dimension to this? You resist the normative, but do you have any at all? I'm, I'm, I'm quite interested in that issue that you just raised about whether we should or should not define those who engage in what might be considered to be reactionary ways as being civic. So I think you can take two positions. You can say that there's a group of people who in theory articulate citizenship as something which is normatively good and any yeah. citizenship or any act which is not for the good of all or for the public good ends up being considered non-civic. I think that's dangerous. I don't think it's dangerous for the people who are engaging in those acts because then they remain under the radar, they can continue building huge movements, but I think it's dangerous for people, for the very people who are interested in democracy and a normative notion of citizenship, because then they ignore the kinds of emotive and affective feelings which build that type of politics. So rather mm -hmm. than calling mm -hmm. it civic or uncivic, I'd like to say all of this belongs in the domain of the civic, that there is right-wing civic action and left-wing civic action okay. and liberal civic action, and that these things are in tension and conversation with each other. And if we don't acknowledge that, then we risk ceding a certain amount of ground to the right. So it's a classic kind of pragmatic response of trying to frame the conversation in a way that draws people to your side of the discussion, but never declaring right absolutely over others. Is that it, more or less? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I would, as a personal issue, be happy to take a position on this and to say, you know, certain things I consider to be good citizenship and other things I consider not to be. But then there'll be somebody else who comes along and thinks that, you know, occupying a factory or occupying the LSE, which I would consider to be good citizenship in many cases, they would define that as absolutely resistant and bad yeah. and civil disobedience. And of course, so one of the things you risk you, being in that position. One of the things young people did a lot in resisting mm -hmm. education fees and cuts mm. was occupied. They developed Absolutely. a kind of process of occupying and including mm. uh, occupying schools. And it wasn't the school's fault, the head teachers were demented, uh, bursting out of school to go into Trafalgar Square to continue protests and so on, to great inconvenience mm. of the teachers. That would be the kind of civic activity which you would applaud in a way, wouldn't you? Say, well done you guys, you're fighting for the future. I think I would think very carefully about that. If we're talking about a place where people are bursting out of schools and going to a square to collect because they don't like the fact that a woman has been elected prime minister, then I would be have a great problem with that. So I'm not someone who says action at any cost. That makes you a citizen. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's a whole nexus of things between thinking about what you're doing, between contributing to social justice, um, that actually 
um, result in some actions being civic and others yeah. being uncivic. But I think also the way you define that narrative, that the poor teachers had a hard time justifying it, was very polarizing between older people and younger people. In fact, yeah. in my interviews and in the work I did with young people around those protests, around the protest in 2003, around the, the, the war in Iraq, there were many teachers who assisted and actively cooperated with their students in going out on these protests. There were many students who didn't want the teachers to walk out. There were students who just wanted to sit mm -hmm. around in their classrooms and continue studying things that happened 400 years ago rather than participating in civic life today. So this polarization between older people and younger people I think is really problematic. Yeah. There are people who have that interest and want to take action. There are people who would much rather sit quietly and watch events unfold before they do anything, just as there are lurkers on Twitter who don't post anything. I used to run a program here for human rights and we used to take master's students, you know, there was a little box where they filled in how good they were. And the guy who was able to say, I built a whole bunch of houses in South America, not necessarily for anybody who wanted them, but I built the houses, mm. is going to do better in the world that's been created by that form than the person who says, I was in a good riot, as a result of which the government resiled from their plan to cut education. I think you've just articulated it. They're going to do better because the people who are designing the forms, the people who are designing the normative tick box definitions of citizenship mm. are the ones at the top. And there is always going to be, unless we challenge that hierarchy, there is always going to be a bias towards certain forms mm. of citizenship. Mm. Now we're drafting a constitution and I, I know you're not a lawyer but you're, you're a media person and also you know and study young people. There's this problem of connection. We're talking about it. Mm. What could we put in a constitution, rights, duties, that would facilitate the re-energizing of the civic sphere, do you think? I think something which connects directly with young people's experience in communities. Mm. And I think there are ways of articulating the constitution, not necessarily in its legal wording, but in the fora in which it's broadcast, particularly mm. the media, particularly schools, which would bring it much closer to young people's everyday lives. So always starting with things which are very relevant to them, things around democracy in the classroom, for mm -hmm. instance, would be a really good way of re-engaging young people with the process of drafting a constitution. Just getting mm. a group of young people around a table and asking them to draft something about the way in which they should learn, about the outcome of five years of schooling, around policies on homework, on discipline, on clothing and uniform. Such kinds of things actually help them to understand the rights and duties in a much broader sense and to connect them. And of course there are many young people, including 12-year-olds, who I think are quite able to engage in the sort of abstract thinking required um, around issues of democracy and participation in social life. We do not give children enough credit for how much they're interested in democracy. So get these issues, abstract ones, you're right, but through the particular and yes. grow the abstract through Absolutely. the particular. And for Absolutely. these youngsters, the particular is school. The particular is school or any particular, such as family, for instance. The family, family democracy the family. is a very interesting We way say nothing about it. I mean, simply asking questions around how do decisions get made? How much of a say do you have? Do you think you should have that say? Young people are not. Interestingly, when we did a piece of research a few years ago here for, for the LSE about young people and voting, young people are not all in favor necessarily of lowering the voting age because young people don't all trust each other. They come from very different backgrounds. There is a sort of third person effect going on where some people think they should be able to vote at 16, but that other people are not educated enough or not prepared. So we shouldn't automatically assume that young people are all screaming out for the vote at 16 but they are interested in what happens after they vote. Almost every young person that we've spoken to is interested in the four years afterwards and in being spoken to, in being visited, in being talked to face to face. And the face to face has a really huge resonance for them. Spaces and places to talk. Do you think it's the richer kids who are paradoxically less interested then, to contradict what I said earlier on? Or do you think it's right across the board, across class, across gender, across ethnicity, is it a common thread in young people a desire to be involved in your opinion? No, I, th I think you actually hit a nerve there when you said richer, because I don't consider all middle class young people to be rich, but I have had the opportunity, the pleasure of interviewing some very wealthy young people, some young people from very privileged backgrounds, and they are the ones who are perhaps quite happy with the status quo, with the system as it is, with the way in which school leads to a particular type of university, leads to a particular type of job and perhaps into politics. And they are also the ones who see most merit in the current institutionalized politics that we have and who are most perhaps sympathetic to keeping the system as it is and very, very derogatory 
of other people's slap, slapdash efforts to engage in grassroots politics. So in terms of life experience, actually underprivileged rather than privileged. Perhaps in some ways underprivileged in terms of life experience. Shakantala Banjri, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you.